Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty, the number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 127. Today's guest is an actress and comedian. You know her from her unforgettable characters in four seasons on the Emmy Award winning sketch comedy series in Living Color. You have seen her in many films, including Quiz Show, Jerry Maguire, Fuel of the Dreams and Bride Wars, as well as your favorite TV shows such as The Good Wife, 30 Rock and Kidding. And of course, she played Elaine's friend Noreen in two Seinfeld episodes. The Pledge Drive and the Chinese Woman. Please welcome Kelly Caulfield Park. Kelly, thanks for joining. Thank you for having me. How lovely. My goodness. Yeah. I did not realize what a, what a fantastic career I've had <laughs> <laughs> until moments ago. Incredible. So, yeah. So, I have been around, have I not? <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of that career, Kelly, can you believe it? It's been 28 years. What? Yeah, since we met Noreen on Seinfeld in the season six class. Yeah, the pledge drive. So that was 94. So take us back. I know you, beforehand you said you don't remember anything, but let's see what you can remember. Yeah. Was, there, um, was there an audition process for Noreen? Uh, how'd the role, how'd the role come about? an audition process. And the thing is, is that I know there was an audition process only because I – well remember that I was called back, but I don't like have a super clear remem- memory of the first audition for it. And that's likely because frequently even, you know, things happen so rapidly. Yeah. That you're not really, you know, it's like, wait, what? You know, even like a, a couple of weeks later, you're like, oh yeah, I actually went in twice for that. And because, because, you know, one day you know nothing about anything and the next day you have an audition for something and then you go in for it. And then but later that day, you find out you're going in again the next day and it all sort of gets, you know, uh, certainly in the memory of it, it gets sort of truncated into. <laughs> yeah. Do you, well, let's ask this. So do you recall, um, if you knew you were going in for a two episode sort of arc, like the you kind of no. your character this like mini arc over two episodes. So, so how did the second episode part come about? If, if you, re, this, if you recall, this was my understanding of it. And I will go as far as to say that, because I believe me, I'm not trying to represent myself as somebody that knew just what was going on, you know, at, at all. I mean, I was, I was a fan. I was thrilled to be, called in for this role. I thought it was really funny because I want to say it's a little, um, uh, because I did two episodes that were back to back. Yeah. And I don't believe one of them, at least in terms of my character, I don't think the second one was written when the first one was. Yeah, it's interesting because it's two different writers, right? Well, Peter Melman wrote wrote the first one, and then Gamal Prose. Um, so it's interesting, like, like, like to have you come. Back. Well, I switched that around actually with Gamal Prose and then Melman, but to have I, you what it was was that they realized that this was enough of a sort of interesting kind of subplot, which of course was so much of what made up these fantastic episodes, which was all these right. like, little subplots that were going on that you'd follow, and sometimes it, for, you know sometimes over over a period of of episodes and so this idea that you know that elaine's best friend you know was constantly involved with with men that you know that elaine found repugnant in some way and and and, and she you know convinced her in so many ways to break up with people or and then we find out has convinced her in so many ways to do so many really important things in her life that, that Elaine would hold so much sway over this character that we'd never heard of before. It's just so hilarious to me. <laughs> you know, it's like how many seasons, like what was that like season four or five? Like six. Jeez, right? Season six. Yeah. You know, and Elaine did not have like a, a bunch of girlfriends that she was hanging around with. Look at you. For someone who doesn't remember much, you are spot on with all this stuff about Seinfeld. You know your Seinfeld history. Impressive. Well, you know, I mean, I've been alive. I've, I've been. Alive. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, this was hot off, right? In Living Color. I mean, we'll get into that a little later. But brilliant career there, and then obviously, you said you were you were a fan of Seinfeld. Very much so. So you, you kind of knew you kind of knew what you were getting into. 
Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit. We've spoken to a couple people from from your episode, the Pledge Drive. Um, I mean, what a what a great app. Ep- I mean, just a packed episode with great guest stars: yeah. Rebecca Staub, Uncle Leo, Danny Tartable for you no. in New York. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mr. Pitt. I mean, uh, yeah. Mr. yes, Pitt. yeah. There were so many like crazy like offshoot things that Elaine's, it- ha- Elaine Schaff's sister too. Lauren Bowles was the waitress. Yeah, and, and- Julia said. Oh, I love Lauren, Julia's sister. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, so you're the, the blood and so many amazing things. She's a fantastic actress. She, exactly. Yeah. Um, so what do you, what do you remember about kind of the vibe on the set? Um, obviously Larry David was there, Jerry, obviously yes. Max and Pro, uh, uh, Gamble and Prosar were writing it. Like, I don't know. What do you, what do you remember about what happened on set? Kind of who was kind of given direction and, or, you know, who do you well, hang out with? Because there's so I, many. I mean, right. It was like, you know, there's undeniably just an, an incredibly successful, iconic. I mean, I was very thrilled and surprised. You know, I mean, I, I was uh, sort of trying to tell you before that, you know, so often, you know, things happen so rapidly that, you know, it's certainly even trying to recall it. I'm like, oh my God, did that all happen the same day? Or was that over a period of days? It's hard to recall, but, you know, things did happen so, so quickly. And I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be uh, cast. And um, I think at that point, it was unusual to maybe have a callback. Like it was sort of like a thing where you would maybe if you were asked to audition, maybe it would be that you would audition and then they'd say yes or no or whatever it was. But like I was called back because I was going to read with with, uh, you know, with Jerry and with Larry and, you know, sort of be there in the room and get their, you know, uh, direction and everything was fantastic. I felt so honored and and thrilled and then beyond thrilled to, you know, to have been cast. So it was just just super fun, you know, just a super fun adventure to, um, like any of us to have appreciated that show, you know, uh, just, you know, watching it, but then to, to go on the sets, you know, to all these iconic, you know, sets, you know, you're there, you were standing in front of the, of the, uh, coffee shop, of course, but, you know, there's that set and there's Jerry's, apartment and there's you know all these things that we've seen you know over so many seasons for such a long while and so to have the perspective suddenly where I was walking around those sets and then and then shooting some things remotely at the you know on the studio lot um some of the outdoor scenes you know they would set up remotely uh to be, be some of the things that we had outdoors and uh just what a thrill! What a what an incredibly fun and unexpected uh, thing for to happen for me. Yeah, that, that must have been incredible. For it sounds like you were a fan of the show, definitely. Was, and then you came from a living color. Was there a nervousness though when you came? Obviously, you knew Saipa was a big hit. Sure. And, and you mentioned kind of all these people you looked up to, and now you're like in their presence. I mean, I guess it was kind of a, a good nervous energy you probably had on set. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think, uh, I think, I, I didn't feel um, shut down in terms of nervousness. I think I just felt excited. Right. Uh, you know, you that sort of can flip sometimes, or you know, you can kind of feel like you either are like anticipating and you know excited about something, or you feel like, holy God, I'm going to throw up. So <laughs> it was really more of the sort of joyful anticipation of mm-hmm. of being with everyone and and just sort of you know for the brief time that I was there, which actually then surprisingly was over a. a a two week period, yeah, it's a one week period, which is all I had been hired for to begin with. Um, it was very interesting to see, um, a little bit of the working life of these people that had been uh working in such beautiful ensemble with one another over a period of six seasons it was yeah i mean six seasons they were pretty much you know well machine i'm guessing at that point and, and oh, you know absolutely 
the, you know, uh, the fact that they I, brought you. I really yeah. remember besides the well-oiled machine, which of course is a fantastic thing, you know, to think, oh, you're going to get a great episode from these people. They know just what they're doing. Yeah. Would I remember? And, you know, these are the sorts of things that, you know, you, you say, oh, if I were a fly on the wall, well, I was a fly on the wall. Right. And here, the, the Michigas, the nonsense of what was happening, you know, in the beginning of the day, you know, something yeah. happened the day before. Somebody was at a reading for something and somebody saw it and then they would talk about that or somebody was going to a thing that night or they had seen somebody at an award ceremony the night before, whatever it was. The regard that this cast had for one another was so palpable. Mm -hmm. And I felt um, honored. I mean, I, I wanted to sort of keep that fly on the wall. I certainly didn't feel that there was anything there to contribute to, but just to appreciate, I think, uh, the sure. beautiful uh, camaraderie and, and, uh, the appreciation that they had for one another that seemed to go beyond even, uh, regard that, that artists and players have for one another on a regular basis. It was so deep and so beautiful to see it. Yeah, that's amazing. And you, and you, you know, one of the few people that, that actually had a scene with Larry David on the show. Right. <laughs> so exactly. I'd love to, yeah, I'd love Larry to hear because was, was he, was he always that guy, the man in the Cape? Was he going to be that guy? Like from the start or were they like, we can't find someone I'll do it. Like, how did that, it just, I love seeing Larry, uh, you know, as an act, you know, I in the know. show, we're always trying to pick him out whenever he's kind of a background person, but he actually exactly. had a couple of lines. You had a scene with him at the end. Um, you know, what was that like kind of just working with Larry in that, and that sort of uh, realm of, of acting, not so much running the show at that point. It's just incredible. Right. And very much with such a, uh, in, and again, I'm not claiming any, uh, I, I don't, I don't really, this was, I, I had the privilege of having a, like a little, a little glimpse, right, into something that was so much more known by the people that were really living it for so many seasons. I just had a little tiny glimpse, but it was, uh, it seemed evident to me that, he, that he was the last word, right, on everything that happened and that that was not at issue. It was a welcomed that that was always going to be the last word on what went down. And I had come from an experience where that was kind of the way things were set up, where Keenan Wayans had the last word right, right. on what was going down. So I just, you know, from my own little perspective, playing my own little role appreciated the through line and the and the very very direct intention that was coming from him where he was the one who ultimately was going to say let's get back to work we'll see you after lunch we've got to rewrite the scene or this is working great and we're going to have the network in this afternoon and they're going to see this and this is what I want and it it was a very um easy and uh and and uh joyful uh to me again that my my opinion was that that was a very easy relationship that he had with everyone and that everybody looked forward to that uh, uh sort of last word on stuff and that that uh really lasted into not just the rehearsal process which is of course especially in television it's everything because every single day you're building toward the ultimate thing that you're going to film in front of an audience twice, probably. Right. So uh, he was so much a part of all of that, even to the point where he was the one who was the guy on the set during the filming in front of the audience that was saying, everybody come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. What else can we use here? Give me another line. Give me another joke. Oh, wow. How can we end this scene? And it was so such an ensemble that I saw uh, that he was leading, but that he had such beautiful respect for all of the writers that he was working with. Uh, again, if there were there are other people that had different opinions because they had a different perspective, they were writers. I don't know. As a guest coming in. That's what I saw. And I was so impressed and so thrilled to be part of it. 
and so uh yeah it was it was fascinating to me and uh and 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 unsurprising that it would take that level of uh mastery to produce what they did for so many seasons you know Oh yeah, and it must have been really surprising. Like you said, you got that call back, right? So were these taped literally like a week apart? Like you, you, yeah. finished, you finished a pledge drive and they, and they, said, like, they said, Kelly, I, come back. I'm pretending to remember, but I don't really remember. I'm going to say that started on a Monday and we taped on a Friday, but that might be a lie. Maybe it was Monday and Wednesday and then we continued. I don't know. But the deal was after the taping was finished, the next morning – there was a message from my agents that they wanted me to come back. That gotcha. they had something that they had continued. And that's literally what they did. Because if you look at those two episodes, there's tons about both of them that have nothing to do with one another. Of course. Yeah, yeah. right. But yeah. The, Nos- yeah. You, you, were you were the, you were the through the, line. You had like a mini yeah. arc. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. And I thought, that, I thought the chemistry of you and uh, Brian Reddy was just incredible. Oh, was, I thought you guys oh. would have stayed together. <laughs> He was terrific. Was he lip syncing or did he say words and they like dubbed it? Do you remember that? You know something, that (laughs) fellow, I mean, and I, I'll tell you at the time, I felt so, I felt so sorry for him because he had worked so hard on getting that voice that could kind of be like borderline. Is he sounding like a woman? Is he sounding like, like whatever that was supposed to be, right? Like that could possibly mistake him for me, right? So that the, they, that he was working so hard to do that, and that ultimately what they did was that they either I don't know whether they sped up his voice and put it in, or they had somebody else lip syncing. But whatever it was, it was not his natural voice that was presented, and it was very funny. I mean, it was definitely funny, but I think he was like, you know, I mean, what I remember is like thinking, oh no, you worked so hard, you know, to kind of make this work. And then they just sort of did it like technically or whatever. Yeah. And you, you and Elaine sitting at the counter and you discussing like, oh yeah, he has a loud voice. No, not a loud voice. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then you obviously eating the cookie with a uh, fork and knife, uh, just classic scenes. Have you done that ever since? I'm curious. Eating a cookie with a fork and knife. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm intolerant, but anyway, a couple, a couple like uh, things we've always had on our mind, especially in the Chinese woman, um, that just never really made sense to us. And you yeah. mentioned earlier, right? The friendship with Elaine obviously it came out of the blue. Sure. And Jerry mentioned to her you that she kind of ruined your life. She encouraged you to join the army and then go AWOL. Like, yes. Where did that all come from? Like, it never got addressed, like, prior or after. I, I honestly, I mean, I would only be guessing because I certainly wasn't, you know, I had no reason to say, say, you know, what did, what, what made you write it like this? You know, at the time I was doing it, I just sort of accepted what was, what was there. But to me, it was so funny that Elaine could possibly have somebody that would be described as her best friend that we literally in six seasons had never heard of. (laughs) Yeah. It's sitcom for you, right? (laughs) You'd never heard of her. (laughs) And then to make it even more absurd, Elaine has had such an enormous effect on this woman's life, she has literally been a huge driving force in everything that Noreen has decided to do <laughs> over yeah. the years. And still, I mean, she, you know, caused her to break up with this man because, you know, she felt like, that, oh, yeah, maybe he is a high talker. And then end up with Kramer. I mean, this Noreen's life has gone really badly, really by uh, Elaine's terrible advice. And to have a history of this terrible advice, it was so funny to me. I mean, I sat there in the, I remember sitting in the seats, you know, in the audience, watching them rehearse, watching Elaine and Jerry rehearse that scene where, you know, it was like, who the the hell ever heard of Elaine? And all of a sudden, like, Jerry's got this history of her. Like, you remember when Noreen went to AWOL, you encouraged her to go, first you encouraged her to enlist. Right, right. Then yeah. you encourage her to a wall, and yeah. you know, and Elaine's trying to justify. You know, she feels terrible. You know, as Elaine will, T- 
terrible. Oh, you know, you know, so this whole thing, and it was like this very stereotypical thing that this complete stranger that had never been heard of before was certainly inserted into. And for that to be me, it was just delightful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about the Living Caller. I mean, it was one of our favorite shows that was on. Aww, your characters were amazing. So I know you, you met your husband while you while you were on it, I, um, uh, who we also loved in uh, Fargo and A Simple Man. But, um, you know, there is there is a Seinfeld and a Living Caller connection. Um, Joe Davola, right? Joe Davola was a, a producer on A Living Caller. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's well known as a Seinfeld name, uh, crazy Joe Davola, the writer, um, uh, which we know he's a real person. And, th- and there he is. You worked with, you worked with the real, the real yeah, Joe Davola yeah, yeah. and, uh, on a living color. We thought yeah. that was a cool little connection there, Absolutely. but, uh, um, yeah, we were huge, huge fans of, uh, of a living color. And, and, uh, you know, coming from that sketch background, um, Anything that they let you kind of work with on the Seinfeld set where there was any type of ad living, you kind of just stuck to the script. I know you had a Melman script and and a Gamble and Prose who are two two heavy, you know, heavy hitter writers. Absolutely. But, I mean, uh, you know, how much did you have to do with any of it? Nothing. I mean, all I really needed to do was show up and just read what they wrote. And it was kind of great. Truthfully, I remember um sort of making a decision at one point to like do this like weird, like like sobby kind of cry, like, like help me kind of thing. And yeah, yeah. during the filming um, of the second episode and because, um, because uh, Kramer is saying, Hey, Jerry, she, you know, she's pregnant or, you know, whatever. No, she doesn't say she's pregnant until the very end. But what it is, is that it's just the sort of thing where it, it w- was just me and Kramer in the frame. And we filmed that a, a bunch of times. And then I did like this kind of wacky cry or something. And I remember that that was, I did that because Larry had laughed at it during a rehearsal. And then here comes Larry during the taping of it. And he leaned way into me so that I was the only one who heard this. And he said, it's too much. And I said, awesome. And I dropped it immediately. And I thought, oh, God, that's so great that he, like, trusted me enough, like, to not be a complete that he could say something like, like, what you're doing is too much. And that I wouldn't, like, lose my mind or, like, (laughs) like, that that he trusted me that much that he knew that I would understand that that was too much. I just felt like that was that was very special to me to feel for that very millisecond that I was part of that ensemble. That's and great. like just like get a word from Larry and change it completely, and then that's what they used. I thought that was uh, I, to me personally that was just a lovely, lovely thing that I yeah, got. It, it, it's uh, we've talked to over a hundred guest stars now, and it, it, that's a common thread is that the big four are very giving. Larry was very giving, like very welcoming. I mean, it's, and it's Michael Richards. It's it's funny you mentioned him. Yeah, that that scene with him, I believe he's you know. Elaine calls and goes, I'm calling the shots now, you know. That's right. So I don't want to make comparisons. It sounds like, you you know, you made some parallels between um, Keenan Wayans and um, Larry. Sure. I'm kind of thinking about Kramer and and maybe Jim Carrey a little bit, just their their physical styles. (laughs) Um, Right. I mean, I guess there is some similarities between just, I guess, not even the funniness of these people, but kind of just professionalism, right? And how they how they made funny look easy, right? I guess you saw that on both sets. For sure, for sure. Also, I think uh, what both of those gentlemen uh, have in common was that they had been uh, hired, obviously, uh, sought after because they were the perfect kind of, what was thought of as the perfect addition to what had already been assembled, or a perfect a perfect uh, a piece of that because both of those gentlemen were never ever going to do exactly what was given right right they would always do something that was just a little bit its own thing and i mean larry knew that from from michael you know from fridays i mean from right from years yeah knowing what he was capable of where you can say to somebody 
we, we can write, we have the greatest writers on the show and I still know that we will hand it off to this gentleman and he will do something that none of us have thought of yet. And that's the beautiful uh, nature of an ensemble. And Jim fulfilled that in his way on In Living Color and Michael certainly beautifully fulfilled that on Seinfeld and everybody did certainly, but you always have to have the sort of outliers of the nth degree of absurdity, right? To be able to, to, uh, to hold that standard up by which the rest of us kind of say, look what all these spaces that have opened up. So <laughs> speaking of that absurdity, you, you, you fit in like a, a puzzle piece on, on both shows. So has a girl from, Correct me if I'm wrong. De, De Plain, Illinois? Is that where you're from? Oh, absolutely uh, false. I don't know how that ended up. I, right? Cut it. Cut it. By the way, the Kelly, the reason I mentioned it, the reason I mentioned it, the, yeah. the Mega Millions winner, literally, the winner just came from De Plain, Illinois. So I figured you'd have some connection. But who knows if that person actually came from De Plain, Illinois? Because wow. I did <laughs> not get that off freaking like whatever IMDb or Wikipedia or whatever the hell it exists. I've never even been to De Plain, Illinois. I went to the Good <laughs> Drama in Chicago. And I swear to God, that was the first time I'd ever been to the Midwest. And every single state there has claimed me at some point. I don't know what the hell's going on. I'm a New Yorker. That's what I thought. Through and through. I thought that's what I thought. Like Manhattan? Where where you I'm 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 a bit exaggerating my accent because I'm from Bronxville. I'm from Westchester County. Oh, neck of the woods. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because I'm Roger I'm Goodell, the whole thing. Instagram, you're always doing you know, Hudson Valley. I don't know from I only I only learned how to, to pronounce Duplain when you said it. That's <laughs> planes. <laughs> that's not where I'm from. Uh, we gotta stop. So, we gotta um, start digging deeper for our research. The next thing you know, you're on Field of Dreams. So yeah, on yourselves. You've you've done bad book reports. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so so tell us from you know Bronxville to hey, Chicago yeah. to, to I mean, how did how did you land the role? Obviously, you did a bit on Field of Dreams, but. <laughs> How'd you land the role? Yeah, no, you, but that was like a serious role. And then all of a sudden you, you're stealing the show on Living Color and kind of the rest of history. To say it, I'll tell you, I think, honestly, it was as big a surprise to me as it was to anybody else. I think that that show, like so many things, so many, 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 many things in the culture happens at the exact right moment. You know, here's Keenan, who had been so influential in terms of his production of Eddie Murphy's Raw and his doing, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Robert Townsend, you know, uh, I'm going to get you sucka. Like he just was at a moment, right? We're here. And, and here was this freaking network. I mean, Fox, like what the hell was that? What was Fox, you know, like they literally had nothing to lose. They, by the way, figured out years later what they had to lose and ruined it. But at the time, <laughs> they had no idea, you know, what they what they were asking and what kind of latitude there was to kind of get in there and do some stuff before people really understood what was happening. And that was the moment in which In Living Color was was born. And that's that's where it existed. And it was incredibly exciting to be a part of that. I was as shocked as anybody. I'd never been on television. I was a theater person. I had studied drama, for God's sakes. You know, I was I was in plays. I didn't know anything about this world, except that I thought it was an incredibly exciting idea. And I was like, wow, that's cool. You know, and uh, for some reason, uh, went to an audition and got picked out and got to come to Los Angeles and, and do 20 minutes. I was like, minutes, I don't have any minutes. What are you talking about? Minutes? <laughs> what am I like a board meeting? Like what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and what they meant was, Oh, well you are funny. So you must have some minutes of stand up." You know, I said, I don't do stand up," And they said, Oh, just come anyway. And I was like, what the hell, man? It's the eighties. Sure. I'll go. Wow. I, wow. Yeah, but I, then you, you, you're pulling you're incredible like, on it. Yeah. Innocent out and uh, Dice Clay and Woody, Sally Struthers. I mean, yeah, well, what was your favorite of the uh, Living Color that you did? What was one of your favorite sketches? You know, everything that you're mentioning, honestly, uh, everything that you're mentioning are characters that people said to me 
uh, we wrote this. Can you do it? And I said, yes. And I had absolutely no reason to think that that would have been a good answer, except that I just, I just was so, I wasn't cocky. I just was willing, I think, or just excited about the prospect of doing something that I'd never really been asked to do before. And, and of course there was always Jim Karen who would be like, Oh, well, this is what this guy sounds like to me. So this is what like, like I would literally do an impression of somebody like filtered through Jim. (laughs) It was like a two man job. I swear to God, because I'm not an impressionist. But I would just say yes to everything because why not? You know, like, just <laughs> why not? And that was very much the spirit in which uh, I went through that audition process and very much the spirit in which I was cast on that show. I'll tell you the first season of that show. I just kept thinking, they've got to figure out. I This has been a mistake. I mean, how can they possibly have chosen me? <laughs> I was so impressed with everybody and everything that they could do on stage. And that just was not the world I was from at all. But, you know, things happen for a reason. I mean, David Allen Greer and I both often thought to ourselves, well, we're the theater knuckleheads that they plug into anything. And and then we'll just kind of like make it work. Like, we'll just make that work. Like, oftentimes we were playing roles that weren't particularly funny, but they were functional. And you had to have somebody that could do that. You know, you had to have somebody that could sort of go in there and understand the functionality of a sketch, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what we brought with our theater backgrounds kind of thing, you know, yeah, Yale drama graduate. And I think like I, you know, the parallels of Seinfeld, they're interesting, right? Uh, Jason Alexander, similar background with theater. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Julia, Julia Louis-Dreyfus with SNL, similar to you, younger in a career. I, like, I wonder if you guys ever chatted about any of that while you were on set with her. You know, I didn't, I really honestly didn't have a chance to chat with her about anything personal. Uh, Ironically, I did have a tremendous amount of time to chat with her, with her sister. (laughs) Just because we had the same time off, you know, and what a wonderful, uh, what a wonderful person as she was. And, And that was an awful lot of fun to spend that time with her. And she really had very, newly been on the show and had just graduated from NYU. And so there was kind of like that, that kind of thing where I was, uh, um, you know, had that sort of a connection there, but I didn't really have an opportunity to chat with Julia about like her SNL years or paralleling that to, you know, being from a sketch comedy background as well. But years later, she uh, was on a show. Uh, she had so many really wonderful shows, and some of them work did not work as well as others. But uh, one that uh, she did that her husband uh, produced, uh, Brad uh, Rocket, was she uh, was on a show, um, and my husband Stephen Park actually played a cab driver in the episode, and in the entire episode. It's a series of flashbacks of what she's been experiencing in this whole day that's preceded this cab ride. So it's all in flashbacks that she's telling him this story. And uh, I actually visited the set and hadn't seen her in so many years and stuff. And she was lovely and, and you know, so warm. And it, so it was nice to, you know, sort of have that connection and then you know uh two years later you know when you have an opportunity to see people again it's it's just always so lovely i think and fulfilling yeah that's that's great um yeah Yeah. that's so nice to hear um you know the other part about the the one of the greatest parts of of the chinese woman episode is uh the the frank and estelle uh costanza you know jerry stiller and and just we're huge fans of them i'm not sure you know were, were you were you there for any of that uh, taping? Did you, get to, yeah. did you get to interact with the, them at all, Jerry Stiller oh, and um, yes. and uh, yes. and, and, there? I've been huge fans of them before that, and and yeah, I mean, just they are both of them were just such such show business legends, and just to watch them work and the just the way they interacted with one another and. Also, just the way that people would have to like 
literally bite their cheeks to keep from laughing, guffawing out loud before a take was done because they were so funny. They would crack everybody up. They just were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Amazing performers, both of them. So, yeah, you spent a good solid two weeks on the set, right? Um, <laughs> it was like two years. I mean, felt like two, yeah. So you hung out with Laura. Anybody else you hang out with? We heard, we heard, or who'd you go to lunch with? We heard some good stories. Rebecca Staub from your episode. Maybe, maybe she, she stole Uncle Leo. They spent a lot of time eating lunch together. Yes. Um, yes. Maybe she might've been with, with Uncle Leo more. And, and, and forgive me, this is so awful. And it's late here, right? I'm like, I'm tired. It's like, I, I'm like, this. Is, you got me up past my bedtime here. <laughs> I, I remember the fantastic actor that played, um, the Chinese woman. Oh, Angela Dorman. Gorgeous actress, but also an incredible playwright. I don't know if you know that. Wonderful, I know that. wonderful writer. Had not many years after that a fantastic play at the Humana Festival at the at the Actors Theater of Louisville, which is a very reputable uh, theater festival <laughs> in these United States. And I just thought that was like an incredible thing that she. Uh, was just, it was almost like I remember talking to her about that, you know, the fact that she had gotten this episode and it was kind of fluky for her as well. And it was fun. And I just thought she was um, a very interesting person. And I thought she she played her part so, so well on the show. And uh, also, you know, it's always just so interesting when you are so many ships passing passing in the night uh, to, to have uh, the privilege of knowing what people have done beyond, you know, maybe just of uh, being uh, actors or, or fulfilling the roles that you remember seeing them in. And, and, you know, she's, she's a fantastic writer. Um, anyway, uh, just, uh, I do, yeah. uh, I do remember talking to her and, and feeling thrilled uh, was, about her. Yeah. She was great, but just remember only, only one guest star got brought, brought back, back to back episodes. And that was you. That's Noreen. true. You know, I win. No matter how you slice it. Yeah. And it's so sure, funny. Sure, she wrote a play. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, and it's funny. You talk about your husband being a cab driver with Elaine or Julia and then you kind of reuniting. We we always knew Noreen would reunite with Elaine at some point. It just happened to be on a probably what the old the, the Christine show or whatever it was. But sure. uh, um, did you ever uh, did you ever. I know in the finale they brought back. If you remember the finale, they brought back people they wronged. I was just I was wondering if if they ever reached out to you or um... no. Um, you know, God Almighty. I mean, well, for one thing, isn't that like the most? I just seems like for they are forever answering questions about like what was disappointing about that. It's polarizing for sure. Yeah. I do not understand how anybody could have fulfilled everyone's wishes for right. Help. Exactly. Exactly. I really did. I thought it was terrific. And yeah, I got no complaints. Every single person. My God, if that's the precedent for who they wronged, right. that would have been a 48-hour show. I mean, that they wronged everyone. Every I could see you on Curb. Did Larry ever – you ever audition for Curb with Larry? <laughs> I feel like I could see you, uh, you know – being somewhere with Larry, I love where you, you, you that. yeah, I get love into a little that. argument. I'm such, like, I, such a huge, a huge fan of his. Uh, certainly, certainly, Seinfeld is. It, it, I mean, just sort of, you know, obviously speaks for itself. I mean, here you guys are are having this whole show devoted to to uh, appreciating uh, all that was Seinfeld, but uh, the Larry David show has been. Uh, I mean, just so much enjoyment, you know, I mean, I just, I just love his whole kind of take on everything, his enjoyment of, of things. Uh, yeah. I'd love to work with Larry again. I almost killed Larry. I don't know uh, if you know this, here's a story for you. Um, in that last scene, which you uh, uh, very sweetly refer to the last scene, but as we very well know, is the uh, feed that happens under the goddamn credits for wherever they're playing it. It's like, yeah. what happened? Like, there, yeah. I was acting. What? How are all these credits now just, you know, fast <laughs> rolling through this whole scene? But at any rate, that is where that scene exists that is supposedly against the New York cityscape which by the way is backwards because they put it up backwards 
So we're on the Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, if we're in Manhattan, we were looking at the city backwards. But at any rate, that's a little trivia for you. The other thing is that Frank Costanza's lawyer, of course, who is the man in the cape, who ends up um, saving Noreen from suicide. <laughs> right. A little dark, but it's all right. Kill herself, you know, because she's pregnant and things are uncertain. Oh my God. This is like literally as I'm speaking these words, like the repercussions are going to make my head explode. But at any rate, um, Larry says, and we filmed that in front of no one because they had to put up this whole thing and there had to be a ladder up because he is supposedly standing up. So doing that in front of an audience would have been tedious. So they did that before the audience came in. And Larry said to me, just jump into my arms. (laughs) Now I'm standing on a ladder and I know I'm not now, nor have I ever been a skinny little actress. If I ate lunch with anyone on the set of Seinfeld, I ate my lunch. Let me just say that. I was not somebody that was going to go woof into somebody's arms. I'm like, wee. Like, I was mortified that he was even suggesting this. I was suddenly saying, Larry, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I might look like somebody that you can, you know, but I'm actually kind of hefty. He was like, don't worry. Just do it. No problem. Cameras roll. I say my last line. I jump into Larry's arms. He collapses. (laughs) I collapse on top of him. It is, yes, the worst nightmare. It is like the nightmare you have about like showing up in your underwear at school. It's like, how can this have happened? Like I warned him like so hard about this and the girth of my body has collapsed this man into the ground and I may have killed him. I don't know. Like, cause he hasn't, I haven't seen evidence yet that he could walk, but yet he, he. Wow. I wish we had that footage still. It's gotta be somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm certainly sure I do. I wish I had that because it, it because the nightmare of it's playing in my mind is not enough of a, a problem. In when amazing. I saw amazing. Well, Kelly, we can't thank you enough. Yes, you can. <laughs> thank <laughs> Hey, from a Bronxville Bronco to Noreen. What, can't be- Bronco? What? Yeah. Throwing out the references. I love it. We got it all. But listen, I mean, incredible career. I, thanks for making us laugh all this year. Oh, really. You're so darling. And I really appreciate your persistence. I am, uh, in spite of appearances, a rather a shy person. And, and uh, I never can understand why anybody wants to talk to me about anything I've ever done. Um, no. We so know I why. Appreciate, I appreciate it. I truly do. And you're both charming, and I'm pleased to have spoken to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kelly. My pleasure. My pleasure. Be well. Good night. Good night.